muted. To advocate to innovate webinar. Um, as Norval mentioned, we'll be recording it. You'll have access to the slide deck. And all my contact information is in here as well, my email and cell phone. So if we don't get to something or if you'd like to talk more, um, please do feel free to contact me. It's a fascinating topic, and I've got lots of stuff to share, more than we can ever cover in, in this morning or today's presentation. And so um, I wanted to put that out there as well. Um, but again, a little bit about me. Um, I'm an engineer by background, a longtime ASQ senior member, and a certified reliability engineer. And so for more than a decade now, um, as a reliability engineer, I've got to focus on a really cool part of the industry in seeing like leading, bleeding edge technology and getting the opportunity to break it. Uh, you think about all the times you've dropped your cell phone or spilled something on your computer and it mostly still works. You know, I've been doing um, kind of that destructive and aggressive testing to all manner of devices like that, you know, in order to make them stronger, better, and suitable for their work environment. And kind of through that particular job or role, um, there were some things I found fascinating. You know, I'd see some of these new products that, you know, were, you know, by many standards, very innovative, but, you know, no one was going to pay for that. You're like, are you kidding me? This is really cool. If you maybe gave it to me, I'd use it, but I wouldn't pay for it. And then sometimes I'd see these products that I thought were great, and then they just failed to launch or do well in the marketplace. And so it really got me interested in the idea of why some things do well, some things don't, um, and, and how you can really innovate and make money for your company. And so I chose to go back to grad school for a while, about a year and a half ago uh, now, at the University of Texas in Austin, where I'm based. And they had this really neat program, master's degree program, that was about technology commercialization. And so it kind of combined engineering, business, market research, and evaluation, um, and gave me a chance to explore some of these things. And this is one of the areas that I was particularly interested in was, you know, what it takes to really um, innovate and you know, get something going for you. And so first, you know, I'll start out with a, a couple of kind of, you know, general kind of definitions, kind of set the stage for what we're talking about and uh, what I wanted to share with you some more information about today. So when I'm talking about advocacy, I'm talking about the ability to you know, sell your ideas to the decision makers in your organization. And this can be public, private, nonprofit, you know, things you volunteer for as well as work. Um, you know, we're accustomed to selling to our peers and our, our bosses or managers, but they're not always the people who are the real decision makers. When I'm talking about the decision makers, I'm talking about the people who actually control the funding, the resources, the things that would really be needed to actually take your idea or your concept and make it into um, a useful product or process or things of that nature. And so that's what we talk about advocacy. And we're also not talking about you know, tricking people into to buying things they don't need. You know, we're talking about something useful um, that, that solves a problem in the marketplace. And um, I'll also talk a little bit more about innovation and the, the kind of the definitions that I see and ones that I prefer over others because the word gets thrown around a lot. Um, you know, I see innovation, innovative, um, you know, those, those kind of terms in the newspaper, in my, in my emails, you know, every day. Everything is innovative. It's mold breaking. Um, but just because something is, quote, innovative by many of those definitions, it doesn't mean it's good. And I'll show you a couple of fun examples. One of them um, is right here in front of you. This product actually made it to market. It's purple ketchup. Um, definitely different, definitely new, but not so appealing or appetizing. So you know, just because someone claims that something's innovative doesn't mean it's something that you'll actually want to pay for or use um, in your day-to-day your -day activities. And so um, what do I mean, or when I'm talking about innovation, um, I'll show you what I prefer. So the one I see you know, thrown around in the newspapers and the popular press a lot is just anything new and cool. It's a different device or method or idea or even sometimes just the act of doing those things people will call innovation. 
But what I prefer and what I think is actually a more useful definition, and certainly in the context of a business or a profit-making organization, is something that's new and better um, that either solves a new requirement, a new regulation, you know, something that's come up different in the marketplace, or it's an unmet need or an existing need that you are going to, to solve in such a better way that you'll drive someone to change. Because think about how hard it is to change software, change a behavior. People have to have a really compelling reason to do that. Just because something is better, it usually has to be better by a significant margin, better and cheaper, better and faster. There has to be a couple different criteria that would actually drive someone to pay money for it. And certainly if you're talking about this in the context of work, you know, we're talking about making products, processes, things that people are willing um, to pay for at the end of the day, not something that's just like, well, that's nice, I'll take it for free, but what are you really going to fund? And so that's my preferred definition of innovation is new and better, not just novel or different than doing something before. And this is, a, I love these kinds of examples because, um, you know, what comes up a lot is, okay, we do market research, we ask our customers what they want, you know, how do you determine, you know, if that what the need, what a need is, or if there's, you know, room for something in the marketplace, and everyone falls back on the example of Apple a lot. Well, Apple doesn't do any market research, and Apple never asks the customers, and that's kind of a, you know, stretch on Apple's real process. Um, but what Apple really was good at was identifying problems, sometimes problems people didn't even realize they had. And so, um, you know, one of the big ones that I think about a lot is just all the, the social media things out there, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Did any of us need those things? If a company had asked us, you know, could we have even articulated something like that? Um, but, you know, the, the people who were in that space were like, you know, think of all the times like you're waiting in line, um, you're for an appointment, you're stuck in traffic, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just, you know, check in, keep in touch with family, catch up on the news. And so, you know, the pain or the problem that was being solved were these little small snippets of time that were out there. And, you know, social media came in to fill a gap that people might not have been able to even express or articulate. And so in today's um, talk, too, I'll be talking a little bit more about the process and communicating the pain or a need rather than the solution um, that you're trying to offer in the communication section of it. And um, so what I don't want to get lost in today's conversation is that the ideas do matter. Um, we're not talking about, you know, just being um, a super sick slick salesperson, you know, making yourself a better sales, um, you know, it is still important that the idea is relevant, that it's good, that it's quality, that it's something useful, but that the idea by itself is usually not sufficient in most organizations. It's really, you know, everyone, we'd all like to think that we'd come up with this great solution for something and everyone would immediately recognize it and run with it, um, but the reality is, um, that the sales, salesmanship aspect of that really does matter. Um, we've seen, all seen lots of ideas um, that were great in our organization and our peers and didn't get adopted, or that later someone else who was potentially more persuasive was able to get through um, simply because they were better at communicating it, um, better at getting in touch with the decision makers and the right people. And so that's what I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about today was, you know, how to go about that and some of the things that can help you or stand in your way. And I like this um, kind, of, kind of quadrant right here because it illustrates a couple key points. And so on the left axis we have how good of an advocate for an innovation, are you or someone trying to press for an idea? Are you effective? Are you ineffective? And then how good is the idea, the in innovation? Is it poor or is it good? And so what you have here are these four quadrants. So you can be a really good salesman of a really cruddy idea and your company has just wasted a lot of money, um, like the purple ketchup. Someone was able to sell that within Heinz, they invested in the resources to do it, and then it flopped in the marketplace. So great salesman, poor idea. 
and then up here you don't have a good seller and you have a poor idea that's actually great. You didn't get it. You didn't. They weren't sell, good at selling some of those poor ideas to the company, or your organization didn't waste any time or money. Here is where we really worry about. This is when you have one of those great ideas, but because it wasn't effectively sold in the company or the organization, you lost out, and someone else, you know, picks up and run with it, runs with it. And so, you know, a good example here, um, for example, is Kodak and the digital camera. You know, Kodak had had that innovation long before, but within the company, they had quite a um, kind of divisive discussion about whether it would cannibalize their film and their other products, and they ultimately decided to kind of shelve that, and, you know, the rest of that market took off and left Kodak behind. So those things can... Um, result basically in companies going out of business, losing market share, um, and you know, missing out on the next big thing. And of course, this is what we're all more familiar with. You've got a great idea. You've got someone who's very effective at communicating and convincing the decision makers to do it. And that's where you have your success um, in the market or in your organization. And this is just some examples that I thought were kind of interesting, and there's hundreds of them out there on, um, you know, again, that wasted investment when you're a better seller than the idea would have it for. And these are all real products. So we've got Bic underwear, Colgate frozen food dinners, um, some Lifesaver sodas. And then, you know, this actually seemed like a reasonably good idea. It was a combination of cereal and dried milk where you could just add water. Um, and people, you know, again, you know, think that because I'm successful at one thing, maybe I can enter these other markets, but you also have to consider what your customers are interested in, what their perceptions, does that match with your brand? You know, there's so many things that go into that, but you can successfully advocate a bad idea for your company as well, too. And so we'll talk about some of the ways that, you know, again, you can optimize and try to minimize the occurrence of things like that. But those are always fun to kind of see, like, what were they thinking when they did that? Yeah, it's like not what I expect from that company or that brand. And then the other thing that um, I find fascinating, too, is that um, you don't always have to advocate your ideas, you know, or your inventions, your processes. Many times it's actually better um, to get that outside perspective or another person's ideas or let them be the salesperson for something you've come up with because you know, some of us are just, that's not our, our skill or our desire to be effective salespeople and so you're going to have to recruit someone to do that for you and it, it can work better because one of the things that's a challenge for all of us is you, know, you work in a specific area and you kind of can get that tunnel vision you know this is this is who I'm solving a problem for this is my market but your idea actually has a much better application or a fit elsewhere and many times it's easier for outsiders or other people to see that than for you and I thought this is a great example because it talks about the origins of Plato um, when the chemist who was working on this particular one, they were looking for a material that could um, pull off dirt, fingerprints, scratches, and things from walls and surfaces that you could just kind of roll it on and pull it back off with. And it didn't end up working so great for that. But when they had you know, given out samples to other coworkers and things like that, the kids loved playing with it and they had all these other things. And so it ended up you know, becoming a very popular children's product. And so yeah, that's why it always helps to kind of get some outside perspectives sometimes too, is there may be a really cool application or a fun application or a different application than one that you or your organization um, has considered. And whoops, there we go. And then, yeah, so yes, yeah, so we've been talking a little bit about here, um, the idea does matter. But if you can't sell it, if you can't convince someone, if no one's going to fund it or driving forward, it dies. And so in many ways, selling the idea matters more if you're talking about being able to successfully commercialize or drive it. So you've got your innovation, your idea, your next big thing. You've got the selling or the advocacy part of it. And then there's also an identified need in the marketplace, a pain that's being solved. 
those are kind of the three core elements of most things that are successfully commercialized out in the market today. And so when we talk about you know, how do you actually get to that point, um, this is a really simplified version here. It's a, you know, got other steps in between, but kind of this gets the, the general idea across. And we're talking about persuasion, that the kind of basic steps you need to think about or go through. And so I've, I've talked a little bit about, about communicating the need, pain, or the problem um, that you are trying to solve. And you know, as engineers, as technical people, as professionals, many of us get overly focused on the gory details. We're all about the solution. You know, here's my widget, my gadget, my new process. It's really cool. I worked hard on it, um, and that's interesting to us. Um, but that's not a very effective way to sell it to other people. You know, I've seen so many presentations where people get bogged down and the features and all these wonderful things it does, and people are like, well, that's great, but I'll never use that, or I don't care about that, or even worse, I don't understand it. And so you know, the first thing you want to do is you know, kind of step back and what's the problem that's being solved? You know, what is the pain? How are you addressing you know, those issues? And those are kind of universal things. You know, back to the, the social media example, you know, I'm trying to give people something to do with these little small little snippets of time when they're waiting or they otherwise can't be doing anything else, you know, that they could you know, have some entertainment or enjoy rather than focus on the gory details of how Twitter is going to work or how it's coded or all these different features and things you do. You know, what does it help them do? Um, then you're not you know, stuck with you know, having to have a technical audience who understands all the ins and outs. Anyone in any kind of decision-making authority can understand the problem um, usually much quicker that they can understand your solution for it. And the other thing that you have to do is explain, you know, why does it make sense now? You know, every company and organization has limited resources, both in people and budgets. And so why this particular solution? Why should we pursue it now? Um, what makes it important to do? Why can't we do it six months from now or next year or reconsider it when the economy is better? You know, any number of things that go into that process. What makes it important to do now? And then um, I'll show a little bit more detail on these, but other things to consider is what we call the with-its and FOMO. And the with-its are the what's in it for them. And so, you know, again, we're talking about persuading decision makers. And every decision maker has a different um, kind of incentive in their job. You know, some of us, it's bonuses. Some of it is promotion. Some of it's appearances, status. There's different things that the different decision makers can um, be focused on. You know, a sales organization may be more quota focused. Your budget, you know, finance organization may be, you know, their metric is keeping things as cheap and inexpensive and costs as low as possible. And so your message has to be targeted and tailored to the people that are going to be making the decisions. And it could actually be different in multiple presentations. And so really think about what are the motivators for your audience? How can you tailor your persuasive pitch to the people's needs in those organizations to get what you want for it. And then, of course, the other thing is this universal, what we call FOMO, the fear of missing out, is regret is a, just a tremendous driver. There's nothing worse, and you, you hear people talk about this every day, the opportunity they passed up, the stock they didn't invest in, or the stock they sold too early, or the trip they didn't take, the product they didn't pursue. Um, the idea that they have, but they never pushed. And so you can you know, really use those things as well, too, by talking about the um, lost opportunity if the idea um, isn't pursued. And of course, at the end of the day, you know, sharing your message with a good, credible, interesting story is what makes it really memorable, what makes it sticks in people's brains. And that's really important because again, um, in most companies and organizations, your idea, the innovation is competing with numerous others. And so before we go into this, I was just going to stop for a minute and see if there were any questions, comments, or anything that anyone wanted to ask. I don't see anything in the chat box at the moment. Um, but if anyone wants to type anything or do so, um, again, please let me know.
Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything pop up. And so um, this next slide here, this is something that many of you um, will recognize some elements of. It's a, you know, a version of the Plan Do, Check, Act, the PDCA cycle um, that many of us in the quality and reliability world use. And the same is you know, important, kind of the similar steps in communicating ideas. And so at first, you know, you've got that explain the concept, the pain, the problem, and if you can, demonstrate it. You know, it's a prototype, a mock-up, someone using it, or an illustration of how things aren't working well today, what people are doing instead of using the thing that you're promoting that could solve that problem and then show how it could be applied to, to solve that problem, change it. You can also you know, use similar examples that your company or organization has used in the past that have been successful. And then, of course, you know, this gives you a chance to kind of reinforce, respond to questions, go back and refine your concept, too, you know, as you go along through this um, persuasive process of trying to convince someone that your technology, your product, your idea has merit and is something that should be pursued, you know, kind of in, in the corporate or your um, organization workspace. And um, I love this graphic uh, because it just shows, you know, kind of basic learning styles and this works for kids and adults is that, you know, people are going to remember you, your idea and the concept more if they're actively engaged, if they're not being just, you know, data thrown at and talked to. And so you can see here just how different um, the memory goes as you become more engaged and interactive with people. If you just give them a memo or give them a copy of a presentation, um, you know, quick skim, you know, you're, you'll remember about 10% of that. But if you go all the way up here where they can talk, they can interact, they can touch, they can feel, they can hear, you know, you, you get a much more memorable presentation and those are the ideas that are much more likely to kind of catch on or have people think about or think, you know, hey, I saw that and I liked it, now I'm thinking of all these other applications. It really lets the decision makers, the people in your organization visualize and come up with, you know, hey, you know, I really like that, or it's given me something to think about, because that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that your idea is memorable, that it's going to stand out. And certainly if you're in a company where you, know, you have different budget cycles during the year where people come in and you know, everybody gets 10 minutes or some slot to pitch to management or the decision makers on an idea, you know, what can you do to make yours stand out? Um, and you can see the difference it makes in just a you know, a quick visual versus something tangible, something that people can relate to more. And the other thing that's going to be really important is that you know your audience. And so this is um, another graphic that I really love because it talks about not only, um, we talked earlier about the with it, the what's in it for them and, you know, what is motivating to different people and the different organization hierarchy, what, what their, their metrics are. But you also have to consider their personal style. And so on the left axis here, you know, we have the kind of the, the feelings, you know, whether you're a positive feelings about an idea or negative, and then how knowledgeable people are, um, low or high in the knowledge scale. And so you, you've got people that kind of fall into these five buckets kind of here. And on the cynic side, you have you know, people who don't like your idea, but they also don't know a lot about it. So if you want to put them into your cheerleaders or at least out of the cynic side, you know, these are the people that you give information to. They would, they would be convinced by information. And then the adversaries, you know, these are the people who have the knowledge. They don't like you or they don't like your idea, so they're going to be a challenge. The naive followers, the people who are really um, just they're always the gung-ho cheerleaders. They think it's a great idea, um, but they're not necessarily great supporters because they don't understand it. So they like it, they like you, they like the pitch, but they wouldn't be the people who would be able to convince others because they're low on the knowledge scale. And of course, these are the people you love, these are the people who understand your concept, and they're also personally going to back it. Um, so these people, you just nurture them, encourage them, keep it with you. And then you've got the outright skeptics here in the middle who are the people who are most 
um, influenced by knowledge, information. And so you have to consider these people too when you're putting your pitch together is what's going to convince them um, what would be an effective way to approach them you know, when you're putting together your presentation. And what this means is, you know, as I stated before, you may indeed have multiple presentations that are different, um, you know, different style, different types of evidence. Are they data heavy? Are they emotionally driven and heavy? Depending on who's actually the, the person you're trying to convince that day. And then another thing, of course, that you have to know is what are you? Um, because many times you're going to be the person on the opposite side of that. You're going to be evaluating other people's ideas or your peers' ideas. And um, I thought this was kind of cute. It just came up um, at, in the last couple days. Um, and so I just thought it was kind of fun because they were basically saying, you know, when you're in innovation, is what is your temperament? How do you approach things? And they divided innovators and idea evaluators up into challenges, challengers or defenders with defenders being the people who are you know, still innovative, but their spin on it is that they're working within the confines mostly of how you grow revenue within your company or your organization's current customer base, current product set, the kind of you know, more incremental kind of improvements, and where challengers are kind of in the more revolutionary side. They're like, yes, we're in this model, but we could branch out or move into here or add new customers and clients by creating these new business models, these different things that we hadn't made so that the new people who are coming up to challenge us aren't a threat. And so this is just a little fun thing. If you feel like it, you can take the link at the bottom of this, and it's just one of those little like 10 question quizzes. But it gives you some things to think about you know, when you're looking at um, supporting people in your organization. What are your biases? How do you approach things? and they kind of help you come up with ideas on how you pitch to other people who either like yourself or different. So I thought that was kind of fun. And then of course, when we're talking about um, advocating for your idea, you know, selling within an organization, uh, no one likes surprises. The last thing you want is to go into a major decision-making meeting with no one ever having seen or heard anything your idea or about your idea or your concept before. So we're talking about this kind of concept of greasing the wheels or pre-selling your ideas. You know, having small one-on-ones. You know, having some opportunities to kind of you know pitch your idea in a very low-stakes kind of method or event. Um, getting some feedback, seeing kind of you know any kind of pushback that you get, the questions that you have, and so those things can really help pave the way before you go into a really critical meeting is, you know, kind of getting that early feedback, being able to tailor, see, you know, if you uh, the important decision makers like, ah, I don't think so, you have a chance to find out why and work to address those before you get to that big important meeting. And when you think about having to pre-sell, you know, some of the questions, depending on your industry, you know, or around some of the issues on the left here, you know, scope is how many people or how many resources, how many units could I sell, how difficult is the problem, how difficult is your solution to execute um, or roll out, and of course the magnitude, how big, and you know, the history, and how does it occur, and we'll talk about a few instances on how you can use this to tailor or tweak your pitch to take advantage of things that are in the news, things that are happening in the industry that can help you pre-sell your ideas because all these you know, influence the way that people think. And so uh, then this is another recent image that I thought was fascinating because I thought this is to me like the ultimate pre-sell. Um, it was just in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. This company is called Open Innovation. They had actually bought up um, GE's small appliance portfolio. And I'm sorry, they're called First Build, and they use this technique called open innovation. So First Build um, works with all types of small appliances, and they get their ideas from everywhere, um, people outside the company, inventors, students, focus group, other appliance users, you know, anyone who's willing to offer an opinion. And so they come up with some potential new ideas for small appliances, and then they make really small batches of them and then give them 
to people to try out, to get feedback and see if it's actually something they'd be willing to pay for and how does it meet their needs and expectations. And what you see right here on the right um, is one of the products that actually made it through this process and is now out there. And it's a little, um, what they call a nugget ice maker. So um, smaller than ice cubes and not crushed ice. Um, but you know, people are in love with these little mini ice cubes, and so it became a new product that way. And I thought, how great is that? You're basically not only getting some ideas and feedback, but you're getting very low cost, you know, ultimate information on whether it's truly marketable or sellable. And then you know, first build takes this information, and if they think they've got a you know killer product, they can then sell it off to GE or another appliance makers to become it. So now they've got you know, the market is really giving them, yes, this is a go, rather than, you know, some of the old school ways of creating it, putting it out there, you're thinking you solved a problem when in fact you hadn't. So I thought that, uh, you know, it's been interesting to see this whole open innovation process that some um, companies are tackling. And then, of course, if you're trying to pitch, um, you know, a change in your organization, um, as I mentioned before, why now? Why not next year, next budget cycle, when the economy is better? You know, what makes it the right thing to do in this budget cycle now? Um, so one of the things, obviously, is to establish urgency. And so um, in the news, and I'll show this in just a minute, you know, the Zika crisis is one of those. You know, we had this new or newer threat no money had been allocated for it in budget, but it comes up and all of a sudden it's there. You know, how do you find the money and resources to do that? That becomes a very urgent kind of request. And then, of course, when you're pitching your idea in your company, are, is the economy in a tough zone or is it in a good zone? And so in tough times, many companies or organizations kind of retrench. It's all about, okay, let's make it through. Um, we'll save money on expenses. Um, and all that, um, but if you have something that is potentially a blockbuster, many times they can be um, more willing to take some big risks to be able to overcome some of the challenges out there, especially if they think they're on the brink of not making it. And so those are two ways that you can pitch the ideas. Now in good times, it's all about, well, things are looking good, we're doing the right thing, we're making money, so how do you make more money? but most people are more conservative than we're doing good. Why do I need to take any huge risks or do things, you know, when it seems like I'm on the right track now? So depending on the nature of the economy or your industry segment can also help you determine kind of what things you want to emphasize or downplay when you're trying to sell your idea. You know, as I mentioned before, the crisis, uh, unfortunately, fear works. You know, the whole crisis response um, will generate far more sums of money than, you know, non-crisis applications. And so, you know, Zika has been in all the news for everyone here this year. And so, of course, um, it's been a great opportunity for those people who wanted to work on things that um, either attack the mosquitoes or vaccines that can help it, um, detection tests to find it in the bloodstream and for blood banks, all those things that weren't even on people's radar in their budget cycle a year ago simply exploded once the crisis went out there. And yes, it's really real, but when you look at you know the actual risk associated with it, um, there's lots of things that you know conceivably should be higher priority, but because you know it, it grabs your attention, it grabs that fear in a very you know strong way. People will find money, they'll take it from other budgets, they'll take it out of other things, and so when you have things like that happen, those are also you know opportunities for different types of applications. Um, because as a general rule, um, both in the U.S. and elsewhere, you know people are very poor at assessing risk. You know, we worry about the terrorist attacks. Um, and don't think a thing about you know driving every day while talking on our cell phone and doing things in the car. You know, and obviously far more people are injured and killed in car accidents every year than die in terrorist events. And so, you know, again, that fear factor is a huge driver in in motivation for people. 
And earlier I had mentioned this concept of the whippets. Um, you know, when you're pitching to your audience, really knowing you know what's in it for them, what drives them, because your your targets, metrics, and goals are usually very different from those who are the decision makers when de deciding on whether to you know pursue your idea, whether to give you funding, and so you know, have all different organizations of things within your company, and what's really driving those people. And so, um, you know, it's finance, keeping costs low, improved efficiency, you know, status, the reputation of the company or the individual. You know, everybody wants to be the person who, you know, supported the good idea, not the idea that was like the purple ketchup from earlier. Um, safety, relationships, there's so many different things. And you have to spend some time, you know, understanding your audience and you know, those people who are going to make those decisions to tailor it to address those things. You know, reputation, for instance, oh, this you know, will cement our reputation as the leading you know, innovative supplier of X. Um, you know, those are things that you can actually put to your pitch if that's what drives the organization and the decision maker. And so you know, those are you know, helpful to know and you know, it can really help you drive your idea to successful adoption or you know, cut it back if it's not the right fit for your organization. And then you know, earlier, too, I was talking about you know, building on this fear of missing out, you know, also playing up the opportunities like you know, this is a, a you know, unique period of time in the industry. This is a unique idea and opportunity. If we pass it by, you know, someone else is definitely going to pick it up and go. You know, it's just amazing how much you see about regret, both in personal regret and industry regret about the opportunities that people have passed up or passed by, whether it's you know, buying or financing or being part of something. Um, you, know, the, you, you see those examples quite frequently on companies that you know, let those uh, inventions get away from them. You know, one of the, the things, um, and sometimes they're even tactical because you don't realize the value. You know, back in the day, um, long before Microsoft was you know, the, the giant that it is today, you know, IBM was the one that had the operating system. You know, had invented that, was using it, um, you know, and didn't consider it like a big deal because they were focused on hardware. And you know, Microsoft saw that opportunity, negotiated, and, and ended up taking that piece on. And now, you know, it's a huge blockbuster business all by itself. And so, you know, you let some of those things um, pass by. But of course, they have to really be a good fit for your organization and management. But regret is a huge driver. So if you can play up anything like there, those kind of missed opportunities can help really drive people's behavior as well. And then um, finally, you know, as you get through the persuasive process, you've communicated it, you've not gotten bogged down in the gory details, you know, people understand it, um, you've made the right pitch to the right people using the criteria that is motivating to them, not to you. Um, but it always helps to kind of wrap this up in the context of a story, um, that kind of history, the kind of backstory. Um, put a real person or a name or thing to it. And you see it all over these days. And one of the ones that I think has just got one of those great stories is the Shinola Company in Detroit. For those of you who've seen that, you know, Shinola um, bought the name at a bankruptcy court from the defunct shoe polish company from decades ago. And they decided to open um, initially a craft watch factory in Detroit. And you know, now they've expanded to bicycles and leather goods. But you know, they had this great story about you know, helping revitalizing the country, about building things in America again, about making high quality craftsmen you know, that really set themselves up to be successful as a luxury brand by the story. Um, you know, because the stuff is expensive. You can get cheaper watches and cheaper bicycles, but people, you know, kind of buy in and understand, oh, I really want to be a part of that. I can support it. You know, and here in Austin, we have the Yeti Cooler people. And for those of you who are familiar with Yeti coolers, you know, they'll, they'll keep your ice and drinks cold for days. But they're crazy expensive, too. But they've kind of built out this whole story and kind of mythology around them, again, back to the American craftsmanship that made here and made well. And, um, and so the story can many times help shape 
um, the, the way it's approached and bought and its success in the marketplace, um, even more so than the product itself. And so that um, is a neat thing to think about too, is you know, who are the users? Can I you know, make my um, pitch around you know, what this mom or this you know, other technical person or engineer or whoever I'm designing for, how they would use it, you know, create these kind of characters that bring that to life and make it much more concrete, again, that visceral, so you get that 90% remembrance of your idea by making it something that's compelling and interesting and relatable to people. And so those are kind of fun. And so, you know, yeah, as what I've been trying to really emphasize today is that you know, the, the good idea, the great new product or process is just not enough by itself. Someone has to advocate successfully for it, whether that's you as an inventor, you as a manager, supporter. There has to be someone out there to be that evangelist, someone who can really sell it to the people in decision-making authority because you know, these, all these core elements are really kind of needed to press along without the, the sales or the advocacy piece of it, um, many good ideas are going to languish, they'll never get followed up on, uh, some other company will pitch it, another person will, but if you can get that, you know, that innovation with the need and the advocacy, you know, these are the things that can really make your idea, product, process, success for you, your company, and of course the marketplace. And so with that, um, in the, the presentation deck, I've got some further reading. All the links are in there for anyone who wants to kind of learn a little bit more, or read deeper. And as I mentioned before, I've got all my contact information here, my email, uh, as well as my cell phone. So if there's anything that you'd like to talk further um, after today's webinar is over, I'll be glad to do that as well. And so now I'm going to go back to um, the question and answer box here. It looks like we've got a um, a few questions in the chat box. And so the first one I see here is um, you know, telling the story is an art. Um, what are some hints on how to do this? Well, actually, that is one of the really um, nice things about the Internet. And actually, on this slide right here, if you look in here, Nancy Duarte, Slideology, and Bill McGowan's Pitch Perfect, um, they have some great, beautiful, um, examples and ways of um, putting together a story in a compelling way in a presentation format. And so um, they also have some really nice resources on their website that kind of help you craft it um, for showing. And there's um, you know, numerous examples you know, out there on some of the TEDx talks. Um, but you know, the, the core elements of that is simple, relatable um, and visual, you know, something that people can really, you know, identify with. And so that's why one of the things that's really popular right now is um, kind of creating the archetype. When you have your idea and the idea has a physical user, you kind of create this, what is that, who is really that typical user and not a company. We're talking a real person. So even if you're a business selling to a business, there's still someone at that business who's buying it. So who is that person? Who is their function? What motivates them? What drives them? And then you kind of craft that around there. Okay, so my user is Bill, the IT guy, and you know Bill is really reluctant to change. And so to make him change, um, so building it around you know people rather than abstract comments is you know one of the most common ones there. And then of course you know focusing back to the pain and the problem, not on the solution. Um, you can have a, one slide, very high level about the solution, but once you start talking about features and all the whiz-bang things it does, um, that's also how you lose people in your story. And the other thing is, um, that's highly recommended is that your story should be tellable in less than 90 seconds, what they call almost like the elevator pitch version. And it's got to be you know, simple and elegant. You can obviously talk longer about it when you have to, but when someone asks you what it does or what it is, you've got a very concise, quick way um, that you can explain it to them. And you know, um, I think one of the ones that I saw recently was actually um, one about a veterinary um, veterinary clinic, and they kind of started out was like, you know, 
have you ever had that time, you know, where you, you took your dog or your pet to the doctor or the vet? and they were diagnosed and it was going to be, you know, they needed surgery or something, you know, really just it was going to be more than you could afford and you love your pet like your family, you know, you're having to make these hard decisions. You know, what if you had a place that was, you know, so incredibly efficient and good that they could guarantee that you got the best price for the, the care that your dog needed? Not cut rate, but just, you know, this is what we specialize in. You know, this is the kind of building we're setting up. And so can you set up where people are thinking, yeah, you know, I've been there with my dog or my cat and something has happened and you're facing you know, some multi-thousand dollar vet bill. It'd be great to be able to find a place that I could trust and know that, you know, this is a good price, it's the right treatment for the pet. You know, that they're relatable kind of stories or concepts you can grab your arms around. And you notice that they didn't say, well, we've got this, you know, nationwide chain of 900 stores with practitioners that specialize and they didn't go into all the things they did, but, you know, what, what you care about as the consumer rather than the technical, you know, um, franchising concept that goes behind it. And so, you know, that's what um, some of the things out there that are you know, helpful with storytelling. And then um, there's another question on how to sell ideas to organizations that are dinosaurs <laughs> versus progressive ones. And, you know, unfortunately, that's um, also the reality is that, um, you know, your, your company, your organization has a history, a hierarchy, a personality all on its own. And that's something that you also really have to consider in your pitch. If you've got a revolutionary idea and your company has never, since its founding, you know, been, you know, out there pushing revolutionary changes, obviously it's going to be really hard um, to sell your concept. So can you break it down into smaller, more incremental jumps or changes? And sometimes you have to leave your company. I mean, you look at the example of Steve Wozniak um, and the personal computing kind of concept. Um, you know, he was at Sun, and they were all focused on workstations, and they're like, you know, back in the day when no one thought people could use personal computers or small things, and he was convinced, and sometimes you have to leave, and you see many examples of that out in industries that the company, the structure, the organization is just not conducive to the idea or the innovation you've come up with, and so you either pitch it elsewhere, um, or if you can you know, break it down into smaller chunks. And sometimes, um, you know, companies are willing to break off a little small, kind of like a satellite or a skunk works kind of thing. You can convince them to do that. Well, you know, how about you give me three months and X number of dollars and I show you this much progress. If I can do that, and then we can reassess again at that point see if you want to continue. You know, something where it's not all in one or where it doesn't feel like such an overwhelming huge challenge, you know, if you can break it down into some smaller components, you know, those are things which can sometimes work um, in those types of organizations, um, especially ones that are very entrenched on, I'm just worried about keeping my current customers happy. I'm not looking for new customers and new things. And then, um, let's see, there's another comment, and this one's cute. Um, a business coach told me, people buy on emotion and justify on logic. Uh, logic. Do you agree? Um, you know, I definitely agree that there are elements of that. Um, you know, you have to fundamentally like something. You have to, you know, like the people that are selling it or really the product has to be so good that you're willing to ignore that. So, you know, I think emotion really does make a huge difference, but that I wouldn't say always because I really think that depends on industry. Um, and how um, unregulated or open the industry is. So like in the consumer world, um, very much you'll see people driven by the design, the look, the feel, the cachet, and, that, and those are very much, much more emotional decisions. Um, but in some industries, um, you know, I, I would say things like medical, military, aerospace, there's a whole lot less of that. There still has to be persuasive, they still have to like it, but I wouldn't say that they would be buying on emotion, um, but you know, all of us, I think every one of us can come up with an example of something they bought 
um, that was really, it wasn't a need at all, but you really wanted it. You came up with all kinds of reasons for why it was a great purchase and worth that money. And so we've all been there. Um, but I think that's definitely, um, from my perspective, more um, it varies by industry segment and company. The more highly regulated you are, um, the more restrictive the purchasing process is, you know, the less the kind of emotion things play in there. But again, you know, the, the personal contact and the pitch and the relatability are always important and they'll frequently get you in some of those places that you would normally get the opportunity to even pitch um, if you weren't persuasive, likable, or had a compelling idea. And then um, another question comment in here is, how do you identify change agents within companies to get better momentum on innovation? Um, so there's a couple ways. I'm sure some other people have seen some out there too, but you know, one of the ways that, especially if I'm newer to an organization, you look around at who's been successful and why. Um, and you know, those are the people that you can kind of start with or at least find out the stories. What did they do to succeed in the company? How did they get their ideas in there? And so you look around and see if you can identify some other successful people who've been able to, to drive something um, and also to drive something that stuck. Um, because many times, you know, some organizations will adopt things faster than others, but they're not really good at making those changes or new things stick. They bail on them pretty frequently. Or you have someone who's very persuasive and also an authority who can ram things through um, without doing the sales part to get everybody's buy-in. Um, and so the, you know, the first thing that I do is kind of look around me. You know, who's really been successful? What ideas are working well? What products hit? Why do they do that? Who are those people? And you know, kind of hit them up for them, their ideas. And of course, you know, that goes back to your company culture, really understanding um, how it works, what's important there, because companies are very, very different. You know, I've worked at a number of different companies throughout my career, and what worked at one was very different from what worked at another. You know, some companies have much more rigid hierarchies. You know, these days, companies tend to be a little flatter. Um, some have you know, special little spin-off units for you know, innovative things. Some try to integrate innovation into everything. And so you have to look around to see you know, if your company has something like that, how they're structured, what's important. Um, where you're even at in your profitability cycle. Is the company doing well and growing by gangbusters, or are they kind of struggling or maintaining ground? Um, do they even want to grow? Um, you know, not all companies do. Sometimes you're working for a company that's quite happy staying in a certain niche um, and you know, aren't going to go anyplace else. And so then you consider, you know, is this the right place for this innovation for me and my idea? Um, so yeah, it's kind of a mix of things, and I'm sure there's lots of other examples. Those are just the ones that you know, come to mind as we're talking here today. And let's see, I think that makes me come up to the end of the question answer here. And I'm going to see if I can switch back over to our um, host, ASQ, today. And as I mentioned before, please do feel free to follow up on any um, questions that I might not have gotten to today. Um, my voicemail or my cell phone, my email, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm really easy to get in touch with. Um, so I do really appreciate your comments, your input, any things that you've thought of. They help me think of other things to go and explore on because I really do find this topic fascinating. Um, and I really do think that you know, in, in innovation and advocacy are pretty tightly wrapped up together. Um, that you know, for to really to drive change, you know, you've got to be an effective salesperson or find someone that can help you do that role. Um, you know, if, if that's not your particular strength. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, this pretty much brings us to the end of the um, session for today. Uh, we invite everybody to join us for our next webinar, which will be on Thursday, October the 6th, uh, bringing the work back to America. Uh, we hope you can join us then. Until then, thanks, everybody. 
Goodbye.